What you eat and when you eat it can play a big role in preventing heart disease. That's the findings of a new study, so let's learn more about that. I'm Lee Kelso. This is Health Call Live Online, the place for extended interviews heard on our weekly radio broadcast, the Health Call Live Radio Hour. Uh, let's get to the, uh, the lead author on this study, and he is Dr. James O'Keefe, MD. He's director of the Preventative Cardiology at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute. He joins us live this afternoon via Zoom. Good to talk to you today. Hi, Lee. Glad to be here. I appreciate that. So this is really pretty interesting. So we're saying now that a particular diet combined with intermittent fasting seems to be the magic ticket here. Tell me more about this. Well, diet is always a controversial topic and partly because everybody kind of has their own very deeply ingrained sort of um, notion about, you know, what, what works and there's so much conflicting evidence and reports so that, and it, it's also made more difficult by the fact that a lot of people are out there touting diets with a lot of sort of enthusiasm uh, without much evidence. But for the average person on the street, they don't know what to think, you know, so they just keep bumping along, eating the same old sad diet, that standard American diet. And uh, um, so what we wanted to do I'm a cardiologist. My passion is really prevention and diet is arguably the most important. I mean, right up there with relationships. Okay. Diet would be among the very most important factors for determining not only quality of life, but you know, longevity, quantity of life. So, so we thought we would put together what we, uh, what we surmised by studying all the literature, looking at the best evidence for the diet that improve longevity, heart health, and overall sense of well-being best. And we, you know, we put that in, and it's in the journal of the American College of Cardiology. And the uh, editor in chief of that journal, Valentin Fuster, who we sort of jokingly call the Pope of cardiology, he's he's sort of the unquestioned authority, worldwide global authority in cardiology. He gave it his blessing the other day with, uh, you know, when this when this uh, came out, saying that you know this is really a, an authoritative document. So we're th hoping that this will become like the de facto diet of the American College of Cardiology, which we think it deserves to be, you know considered by anybody who's who's uh, interested in health and well-being. So this is a study of studies. So you've gone through and taken a look at all kinds of research over time and concluded that the Mediterranean diet with a little modification combined with intermittent fasting seems to produce the best results. Now, we'll talk more about intermittent fasting in a moment, but let's talk about the modifications. Well, what is the Mediterranean diet and then what modifications are you making? Yeah, Lee, um, the Mediterranean diet is sort of a um, vague concept to a lot of Americans. In fact, a lot of Americans, when they hear Mediterranean diet, they think, oh, that's great. I love pasta and pizza and white bread. Yeah, count me in. This is, I'm all for this. But what we're talking about is the traditional Mediterranean diet followed by cultures living on the shores of the Mediterranean for millennia. And it's important to point out these weren't the aristocracy of the Mediterranean cultures. These weren't the Roman emperors and the, you know, the kings. These were the Mediterranean peasants. They would fish for their uh, animal protein. They would grow vegetables in their garden. They would grow olive trees. As a writer, Elizabeth David calls the Mediterranean diet comes from the land of the, the sun and the sea and the olive tree. And so they would, you know, they they grow their own grapes in their vineyards and their own olives and make olive oil and they'd eat a lot of vegetables and they'd eat fish and seafood and they'd grow a lot of nuts growing there. Um, and so this is the essence. There was some whole grains in there too and legumes. Legumes are an important part of it. They didn't eat much butter. Um, the cheese they ate was soft, white cheese like mozzarella it tends to be lower in fat and, and higher in protein. Um, they didn't need really any processed food because they wouldn't, they couldn't afford it. The, you know, the people living high on the hog, literally, you know, the aristocracy had the sugar and the white flour and the fatty meat and, you know, all that stuff and, and, and more calories than, you know, than they needed. But these peasants were out there growing their own food and eating it naturally. And it turns out that when we do studies of those cultures, they had remarkably good health and well-being. And it was a five year long study and the primary endpoint was heart attack, stroke or cardiac death. And sure enough, those Mediterranean diets reduced it by um, 
by 30%, highly statistically wow. significant. And as good or better than any drug shown in a study like that. And uh, when you do the multivariable analysis, it was actually things like, like adding those fats, like the extra virgin olive oil and the nuts and fish and the seafood and legumes. Uh, these are the things that, that really made the difference. Wow, that's, that is interesting. Okay, let me take that apart a little bit. So uh, I'm gonna throw away vegetable oil completely and use only olive oil? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. I mean, you do not wanna use those seed oils like corn, corn oil, sun, fl sunflower oil, safflower oil. Lee, this is like, it's, it's not that many foods that you'd be getting a lot of these fats from. It's nuts, extra virgin olive oil, seeds, like pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds, um, avocados, and oily fish. Okay. If you can eat a lot of those, I mean, up to 40, 45% of your calories from that source, you're on the right track. Then you eat a lot of non-starchy vegetables. You eat some seafood and, and fish. The, the beverages of choice are water and more water. <laughs> Sparkling water is fine. No sweeteners, no uh, coffee and tea in the morning. Again, no sweeteners. Red wine is the alcohol beverage of choice. Are we going to drink it all? And, and we, you know, you got to be really careful and keep that. That's a slippery slope. We say, you know, not more than six ounces of red wine, ideally per day for, for women and up to 12 ounces per, per man. You know, it's not for nothing, Lee, that, you know, wine bottles for millennia have come in about 750 mil bottle, because if you split that, that's about 12 ounces each. And that's kind of the, as much wine as anybody needs in one setting, in my opinion. So let's talk about the nuts for a second. In this country, we think peanuts, but peanuts are actually a legume, not a nut. You're talking about actual tree nuts here, right? In that study, it was tree nuts. But to be fair, in the traditional Mediterranean culture, they ate a lot of legumes. And peanuts, you know, they're not quite as good as tree nuts, but they're still like, you, if you're on a road trip and you pull over into a, into a fast food, I mean, a, a convenience store to gas up and get something to eat, that's one of the few safe things you can count on in, in, a, uh, in a convenience store is nuts. So tell me about the role that eggs play in this diet. Do I have to give up eggs entirely? That's going to be a struggle for people. No, uh, Lee, eggs are part of the traditional Mediterranean diet. I mean, it was like we talked about those soft cheeses, yogurts, unsweetened yogurts, uh, seafood and fish and eggs. Uh, eggs are a valuable source of protein. They're also high in lutein and zeaxanthine and minerals and vitamins. It's like an egg is sort of the yolk of an egg. is like a nature's multivitamin. Uh, so it's high in cholesterol, but the studies don't really show that, that eating eggs raises your cholesterol or increases risk of heart disease. So for the most part, we say, you know, don't go crazy with the eggs. You can have five yolks a week. Um, uh, you can have all the egg whites you want because that's perfectly clean, healthy protein. Uh, but yeah, eggs are like a great part of a breakfast. This morning I had, had eggs with like four yolks, I mean, sorry, four whites, one yolk. And then I had cut up a, a sliced avocado, put uh, some, some lemon on it, and then I had some yogurt with nuts and berries. And just, a, you know, like a breakfast of, uh, you know, like champions sort of thing. Um, and, and super healthy and filling. I'm, I haven't even eaten lunch yet, so. I'm coming to your house for breakfast. Uh, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> so fish is uh, an important element. You said fatty fish, so I automatically think salmon. Right. But what else fits in that category? So <clears throat> salmon is kind of like the sort of the ideal one, especially wild caught salmon, because it's high in the right kind of fat. It's low in mercury. It's good, great protein. Most people like the taste of it. Um, sardines are another great choice. That's kind of, uh, some people euphemistically call that a, an acquired taste. I mean, I, I love sardines, but um, herring, trout, um, these are all high fat fishes, sea bass that are, that are safe and, and low in mercury. Um, but it's also fine to eat lots of like shellfish, say shrimp or, 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 or clams or mussels, lobster, um, and, uh, and, and fish like cod that aren't particularly high in omega-3, but they're still like a nice clean source of, of protein that, uh, again, part of the traditional Mediterranean diet. So, um, yeah, I think that, that we, we choose some oily fish, but, but any kind of fish, as long as it's not high in mercury. And those are like swordfish, um, shark, mackerel, um, the, the large carnivorous fish that live a long time tend to accumulate the 
biotoxins like mercury. Yeah, the predator fish. And, and right. I, I, I'm very aware that you said wild caught and not farm raised. That's important, huh? Well, farm raised um, is like I eat farm raised salmon not infrequently. Um, you know, it's a little higher in things like PCBs, um, not mercury, um, but it and a little lower in protein. I mean, so it's not quite as great as, as wild caught, but it's still a good choice. I mean, the key actually, Lee, more important than avoiding farm raised is, is avoiding fried. You know, like if you fry shrimp or bread and fry cod, you know, then it turns it kind of into a not a healthy food. Okay. So the Mediterranean diet, and there are plenty of places you can go online and find Mediterranean recipes. So it gets the endorsement of uh, the nation's cardiologist. That's good to know. Now, One more thing, Lee, before we yeah, leave that topic, because it's super important. The olive oil that you choose, it, it, quality is key. You need to find an extra virgin olive oil, which is easy to find, not expensive. But you also need to taste it. Every time you get a bottle of olive oil, it's not on the label, the polyphenol content, but polyphenols are things that come naturally from, from, from olives. And you can tell they're there by um, taking a, just a taste of olive oil by itself, like a half a teaspoon, swallow it and wait maybe 5, 10, 20 seconds. And if you don't feel any sense of burn or sting at the back of your palate, kind of a back, black peppery kind of taste, it doesn't have polyphenols. And the intensity and sort of like, sort of like the intensity of that burn is proportional to the amount of, of polyphenol antioxidants. And these are super important for your brain and your eyes and your vessels and your heart and your skin because they're dissolved in oil when you eat them they seep right into all through all those those cell membranes which are lipid sort of lipid bilayers and so they it seeps in there and it really really is an essential part of the mediterranean diet but you have to find those high polyphenol content of olive oil and it's not hard to find so just make i am glad you added that that's something that i had not heard before so good on you and i i'm guessing you like to cook here is is, is that right you spend some time you know, in the kitchen I, I hate i hate to say it, but i am like pretty inept in the kitchen but i like the best thing i ever did was marry my wife joan who is a really talented smart dietitian who has a very simple you know like simple sort of cooking style nothing not on a fancy like sauces or anything like that, but super healthy. And actually, to be honest with you, she gets the credit for this diet. I mean, this is kind of, we've been following, we call it the Joan O'Keefe diet for decades. And, 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 but it happens to coincide pretty closely. Her mother was also like sort of an autodidact. I mean, Joan's a registered dietitian and knows all the science, but her mother taught herself, you know, a long time ago, uh, the right diet. And it was this Mediterranean diet that, that we eat today. A cardiologist married to a dietitian. Yes, I'm sure your home is very healthy. There's probably no ice cream in the fridge at your place. <laughs> no. All right. So let's talk about the other component here, which I really find very interesting, and that is intermittent fasting. So this is the thought that you need to give your body a break during the day from digesting food. So we're moving away from the whole idea of eating multiple small meals throughout the day, correct? Right. That was a that was one of those failed kind of like the low fat, you know, the low fat diet, you know, never was much good data behind it. And it failed miserably. I mean, people who are told, oh, yeah, eat six small meals a day. I mean, they get diabetic, obese. I mean, it just does not work. No, you you want to limit the number of meals per day, <clears throat> probably to two or two in a snack. You want to compress. Most Americans get up in the morning start eating as soon as they get up and they eat till just before they go to bed. Sometimes they get up in the middle of the night and eat. You know, people say, you know, they want all sorts of strategies to purify and strengthen their body. I mean, it's not for nothing, Lee, that virtually every, you know, traditional religion down through the millennia have had fasting as one of their rituals for purification. And sure enough, if you just stop eating for a while, you, you know, stay well hydrated, drink water, and other non-hydrating, I mean, hydrating beverages, um, but if you can narrow, start off with 12 hours, you know, so if you eat breakfast at 7, finish by, by, by 7 p.m., and then narrow that, you know, to, to squeeze those together gradually to, to get to even eight hours of eating during the day, then you can, you can have beverages in the other parts of the day, whether you want to eat early in the evening, a, a late breakfast, or combine those two, but if you can get to eight or 10 hours of eating, uh, eating window, 
and at least at least 14 to 16 hours of fasting, it has remarkable benefits, both for burning off belly fat, improving brain health, reducing uh, probably reduces cancer, uh, lowers blood pressure, you sleep better. I mean, there's a lot of benefits. And to be honest with you, the science is still emerging, but we have had enough studies at this point to, to endorse this. And we think that, uh, again, we've been doing this in around our house for you know, increasingly for the past uh, five or 10 years. And, and, and I, th I think I can personally attest it's great for sleep. It's great for energy. It's great for, you know, things like cholesterol levels and reduces risk of diabetes. It, it, it's, and, and here's a really important thing, Lee. Unlike most diets, <clears throat> this one, once you, and you, uh, you sort of um, intimated this earlier, is when you eat or when you don't eat, is probably at least as important as what you eat. So when you narrow that time window of consumption and let your body clear all the smoke out from burning those calories, literally there's free radicals, you know, oxygen's, you know, billowing through our system for hours after we eat. And of course we need to eat, we need that nutrition, we need, you know, we're, we're energetic beings, but we also need a time to clear that, clear that metabolized stuff, uh, the smoke out of your system, the debris. And when you do that, it changes the hormones around. Your insulin levels come down, your cortisol levels come down, so you're not hungry all the time. Well, I myself am on a 16-8 fast and have been for some time, and I completely agree. After you adjust to it, it is not hard. So I don't eat anything after 7 p.m. and then delay breakfast until 10.30 the next morning, and it just seems to work for me. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable there. Perfect. And, and can't you attest to, Lee, also that when you do that and you give your body some time to metabolize that, it's easier, it's easier to sleep well when you're not digesting food that you've recently consumed. Yeah, well, I'm a big nerd. I track sleep every night uh, using an app. And yeah, I have a pretty good, I'm above average across all the sleep profiles. Uh, so I concur with you. I think it really does make a difference. But let's go back and talk about why this is helpful. My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, because I may well be, but my understanding is that when I'm not forcing my body to produce insulin and release insulin in my system, the, the, the cells in my body kind of after they're through digesting sort of go into cleanup mode and sort of wash away the ash of all of that uh, metabolism during the course of the day. Do I have that anywhere near correct? No, that's, that's, very, that's a very good analogy and it's close to, to the reality. Like when you put calories into this Krebs cycle that burns uh, the, the energy and gives us the ATP, the chemical energy to fuel everything from our thinking to our muscle action, to everything to tissue rebuilding to our immunity, um, <clears throat> that there's, you know, there's smoke that comes off and debris. And when we stop eating for a while, that clears and your system, you know, the immunity is better. You know, everything's better. Your sugar, insulin levels come down. But the other th thing that's important about a lead too, which is a hormonal thing, is that when you stop eating, your insulin levels come down. Um, but so if you eat, if you eat right before you go to bed, for example, then your insulin levels go up. And if you're not, the insulin will chase the fat and the glucose into muscle if it needs it. But if, the, if you're not using muscles or your brain, in other words, if you're sleeping or sitting on the couch watching TV, the, uh, it, the insulin opens up the door and stores the calories in the fat, especially the belly fat. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's why it's better to, you know, to eat more of your calories in the front half of the day and then allow at least four hours before bedtime because you don't want high insulin levels with calories being digested before you go to bed because that's going straight to your belly. That's where you get the, you know, the belly fat. Man, that'll be a big motivator to people. So I think you just told me that intermittent fasting fights belly fat. Oh yeah, one of the best ways to do it. The two best ways to fight belly fat, forget about the crunches and the sit-ups. Um, you need to avoid sugar and refined carbohydrates and you need to fast at least 12, if not 16 hours a day. And that goes, and get your sleep. And don't overconsume beer. You know, these kinds of alcoholic beverages. Uh, yeah, that's the best way to shrink that belly fat. All right, well, I, I, I have found this really interesting. So I'm going to, I already, you know, my family, we already are kind of 
accidentally Mediterranean in the foods that we choose. So uh, I will pay more attention to the cookbook and follow that a little more carefully. And I'm certainly gonna continue to annoy my friends and tell them all about intermittent fasting. Is there a thought you wanna leave us with? Um, well, I guess just a couple of practical things is that it's, and with this pandemic, you know, we're, we should be eating at home more often. And so it is a perfect time. Now, it's one of the silver linings of the pandemic is you can get at home, you know, you can, you can eat healthier, you can keep the serving sizes uh, more, um, more reasonable, and you can kind of schedule your day. You know, it's easier if you're working from home to, to kind of get into these uh, healthy habits that maybe can carry over once we, you know, once we have this pandemic in the rearview mirror. But yeah, there's never been a better time to, you know, focus on, on healthy habits. Excellent. We'll leave it there. That is Dr. James O'Keefe, Director of Preventative Cardiology at St. Luke's MD Mid-America Heart Institute and the lead author on a study that says the PESCO Mediterranean diet combined with intermittent fasting is the best approach to fighting cardiac disease. Doctor, thank you. Great. Thanks to be here.